Basically what he's saying here is that he goes on to suggest that presence, truth, etc. are the effects of writing. Right? A signature, just like any other grapheme, involves distance, deferral, um, and iterability, which already means that it's not fully present and has nothing to do with full presence. So it can't do what Austin suggests. I had a weird experience of this. Um, my name is Deborah Diane Davis, legally. And I've always gone by Diane. And um, we bought a house last year. Sold a house and bought a house. And so I had to use the full name. And if you've ever gone through a house buying experience, you have to sign your name a million times. I mean, they sit you, and you do it twice if you have to sell one. Book. So you sit in front of a stack like this tall and this. And for me, each time, it was this huge forgery, because I don't even know who that is, Deborah Diane Davis, right? It's, I have nothing, it has nothing to do with anything mm -hmm. I identify with, but it's what I, what I sign. And in fact, during the process, I looked at my husband and said, I, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm just forging every single one of these and then there was a stop and the realtor had to stop and have me testify to <laughs> so the effects of the signature is very very powerful and um, completely impossible right mm -hmm. powerful and impossible they operate and yet so that's what he's trying to get at him. In, in, in the, you really need to read the rest of this book where he goes after Searle and, and, and you know, cites the signature. And, yeah. I just want to say, it just, it's interesting. Um, did you know forgers, professional forgers, they, they learn how to forge other people's signatures by turning the handwriting upside down? How does that work? It just, hmm. it just you know, and stranges the, um, oh, the writing enough. Interesting. Oh, so they do it. Uh huh. Yeah. Interesting. The very fact that forgery. <laughs> I, 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 I should know that. <laughs> yeah, we should pause for one moment <laughs> over the fact that she knew that little tidbit of information. Um, the very fact that forgery is possible. That's not. That's not a side issue. For Derrida, that both forgery and the so-called legitimate signature are functions of the same idea of iterability, the same principle of iterability. It's because it's repeatable that it can be forged. <laughs> and it's because it's repeatable that every time you sign, it's also a forgery. Every time. It's not just that I'm not used to Deborah. The signature is a repetition that has nothing to do with like truth in a certain way. It's a repetition. And ultimately for those documents you sign for your new mortgage, it doesn't ultimately mean anything if you get up and walk away. But it beholds you to some idea of the note and your terms of payment that really is artificial. And if you choose to follow that. Really? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. But what it's what's what it's trying to do there, of course, is confirm my um, identity. Your momentary presence right there in front of that paper with these other people. Right. As if that were confirmable and as if it were possible. But the idea here um, is larger in that it is a political legal moment that demands that I be an identifiable identity, that I be differentiated, locatable, punishable. I need an address, right? I need to be able to be found. I need a phone number, right? And, and I, ha I have to be di differentiated from 
all those other Deborah Diane Davises, including the one who sped through Pennsylvania and has my same birthday and keeps me from getting a driver's license every time I go. Um, there has to be some way for the law to locate me as an individual, right? Um, part of part of the force of of the social and societal workings is the capacity to differentiate, so that um, the the width is at least artificially ripped apart and and um, the elements are categorized. Right. Okay. okay. What else would you like to say about? This text, these ideas, before we move. You can put them into practice. Do you think that Derrida um, really wanted to privilege Austin ultimately so much as he has wound up doing by propping him up with these, what this has become? It seems maybe it would have. Uh, and kind of slipped away a little bit, if not for his uh, uh, for the destruction of his Well, um, you know, he has some serious disagreements with Austin, but he loves Austin. And, in fact, got a lot of mileage out of what Austin proposed and um, articulated. This is the way Derrida works, right? He rarely writes with... Um, a text that he doesn't admire. But the whole deal is that you're, you're so incredibly loyal to the text that you end up being a, you know, a Brutus, right? a noble traitor. That's the power of deconstruction. You read it so close, so closely that it deconstructs. And so, um, so many of Derrida's texts um, involve a notion of, of his um, reformed speech act theory, right? So whereas Austin instituted something called speech act theory with, with capital letters, Derrida generalized speech acts in language. Right? He generalized it, but he got the language, the vocabulary, the you know the, the idea by reading Austin. So I don't think he he would um, regret. The significance that that um, got attached to all of this. Deconstruction does not consist in moving from one concept to another, but in reversing and displacing a conceptual order as well as the non-conceptual order with which it is articulated. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, this non-conceptual order is not that clear to me. Okay, back up and catch a, a couple of sentences before that, where it starts every concept. Yeah, every concept, moreover, belongs to systematic chains. Go ahead, read that. Uh, every concept, moreover, belongs to a systematic chain and constitutes in itself a system of predicates. There is no concept that is metaphysical in itself. There is a labor, metaphysical or not, performed on conceptual systems. Deconstruction does not consist in moving from one concept, concept to another. Mm -hmm but in reversing and displacing concept a conceptual order. as well. Okay, let's stop there first. What does he mean by that? In reversing and displacing a conceptual order. That sounds like the negative deconstruction, the reversing part. And then displacing, non-positive affirmative, right? right. Displacing that concept. As well as the non-conceptual order with which it is articulated so what does he mean there? 
Well, let's go on. For example, sorry, Nicole, did you want to? That, that, that was in, um, I was thinking the absence. Um, Okay. Yeah, you're getting there. Okay. For example, writing as a classical concept entails predicates that have been subordinated, excluded, or held in abeyance by forces and according to necessities to be analyzed. It is those predicates, I've called, recalled several of them, whose force of generality, generalization, and generativity is liberated and grafted onto new, a new concept of writing that corresponds as well to what has always resisted the prior organization <coughs> forces, always constituted the residue of irreducible to the dominant force organizing the hierarchy that we may refer to in brief as logocentric. Mm. So non let, let's say the remainder, the, what can't, what has not been okay. yeah. right, conceptualized. Mm. Yeah. The residue. Mm -hmm. This is, 21 is where he's actually talking about um, what it means to deconstruct, right? That it's a movement, that it's a way of reading that um, spotlights in a text these contradictions that don't simply flip the privilege, but that in fact... Um, dissolve the, the conceptual order, the binary system itself. Mm -hmm. yeah, on that non-conceptuality, like just a, a sentence even earlier, mm -hmm. this field of oppositions, which is also a field of non-discursive forces, um, the sentence before every concept. Oh, oh okay. So the field of oppositions that is also a field of non-discursive forces. Yes. So so we're talking here to some extent, right, about m the materiality mm -hmm. of uh, of the way systems of concepts play out that extends beyond just the concepts. Right. right. Is that fair to say? So that does he see this this mode of deconstruction as once you rearrange the system by displacing um, on the basis of the, the first flip? Mm -hmm. uh, you necessarily, if you re rearrange the, the conceptual system, you necessarily rearrange a set of non-discursive forces, right. material, right. actual flows of power, it's, however you want to name it. This is why deconstruction is not simply a head game. Yeah. Right. It has material consequences. Mm -hmm. Or that is the hope. Once again, um, let's be really careful because one of the things that Derrida does not say quite in fact, quite the opposite, is that um, because of these internal contradictions in the theory of signs, we should just get rid of that and do something else. Okay, you, you give that a shot. You let us know how it goes, right? Um, in fact, we do operate on, the, on a theory of signs, right? Whether you can articulate that theory or not, you operate on it. And, and that... Um, to say that we need something that's more authentic is already to believe mm -hmm. and have a conviction that's carried over from the metaphysics of presence, right? From that very sign system. So what deconstruction does is not say, okay, um, well, that's wrong. <laughs> so let's do this instead and be done with that. Mm -hmm. What it does is say, let's spotlight these internal contradictions and um, for the purpose of various purposes, most of which for Derrida have to do with justice, which he redefines, ethics, which he redefines, um, their relational impulses that, um, for example, have to do with um, pointing up the problematics of phallogocentrism and pointing up the problematics of, um, let's say, the various oppositions that go into racial relations right, with white male always on this side, right, on the, in the first position. Um, and then after that, we have to go into, through the economic strain, right? We have to, I mean, so 
what what deconstruction tries to do is spotlight these very political moves um, where, where privilege is situated in order to demonstrate its movability and its political ness so that we can no longer consider it simply natural. Right. Um, okay, so, so, that, so then what you do is you, you don't pretend that you've escaped any sort of metaphysical thought. You negotiate with the enemy, basically. Right. When I said earlier that language is your first colonizer, it's also your first liberator. Right? There is no, until you have language, you don't have an I, right? So there is no subject. You're nothing, <laughs> right? In terms of um, the text that you operate in. On the other hand, it also, it, it sticks you to a grid, right, and in a grid, that never again is there anything for you outside that grid. It has colonized you. It's always the language of the other. It's not your language. Your mother tongue is the language of another. And it moved in to give you you and to delimit you in very profound ways. Now that we can say that, there's not, there's not really anything we can do about it, right? Except negotiate it. And that's what deconstruction does. Right. Shall we move into a grammar, or I keep wanting to do that, of hospitality? Did you have the chance to read this text? specifics of the text, if that works for you. Um, this sort of overview will give us a little bit of a grounding to talk about the specifics. Um, uh, yeah, why don't we go ahead and start that uh, It'll come in just a minute. So, on page 29, we're going to start in a ways, if you want to look. Um, on page 29, Derrida asks, this is just a little ways down from the top, does one give hospitality to a subject, to an identifiable subject, to a subject identifiable by name, to a legal subject, or is hospitality rendered is it given, given up or given over to the other before they are identified, pinned, on, pinned to the grid, even before they are posited or supposed to be a subject, a legal subject and a subject nameable by a family name? Do you give it to someone you can identify, or do you give it up even before there is identification and subjectivity? In other words, must hospitality come with certain limits and conditions? Or does the concept itself of hospitality require that it be limitless unconditional, that it precede and exceed the designation of subjects and objects, hosts and guests, guests and parasites. Now, in response to that question, which is what the entire book is after, a response to that question, Derrida proposes that when it comes to hospitality, there are two regimes of law. You can move to page 77 to get, to get um, where he's talking about it. One, there are the laws 
in the plural of hospitality. The conditional rights and duties, or duties, of hospitality that remain conditional and reciprocal, and that have been defined by the Greco-Roman and Judeo-Christian traditions, by law and philosophy from Kant to Hegel, by the family, civil society, and the state. These rights of hospitality are offered to foreigners, to those who come from abroad, we're going to come back to that term, equipped with a proper name and a family name, subjects in law who assume certain obligations along with those rights. Two, and there is the law of hospitality. In the singular, the law commands that an unconditional and non-reciprocal hospitality, both exorbitant and hyperbolic, infinite, be offered to the quote-unquote new arrival prior to identification and prior to anticipation. That it be offered, quote, to who or what turns up before any determination, before any anticipation, before any identification, whether or not it has to do with a foreigner, an immigrant, an invited guest, or an unexpected visitor, whether or not the new arrival is the citizen of another country, a human, animal, or divine creature, a living or dead thing, male or female, close quote. These two regimes of law, one limited and conditional, prudent and political, the other limitless and unconditional, imprudent and ethical, Derrida tells us, exist in an unsolvable antinomy, not simply an opposition, an unsolvable antinomy that is staged, he says, in a strange hierarchy. The law is above the laws. So the law is illegal I-L dash legal, illegal in that sense, transgressive, a lawless law, he calls it nomos a nomos, a law above the laws and outside the laws. He talks about all of this page 75, 77, 79. You experience the law, which is not drawn from any book or tradition, most acutely, when you're attempting to respond responsibly, sorry, what's going on? <laughs> I can't focus. What's, is there okay. okay, so you experience, ah, uh, blood-sucking vampires are going to take pictures. Excuse me. <laughs> um, okay. This is serious, you're ruining, you're ruining my concentration. Okay. You experience the law, the law, which is not drawn from any book or tradition, not Greco-Roman, not Judeo-Christian, most acutely when you're attempting to respond responsibly, but you can't finally complete your obligation. So this punishing infinitude of the demand is dramatized in film, just for example, at the end of Schindler's List. Have you seen this film? Okay. For all its issues, um, it does this, this very nicely. When Schindler, having plucked 1,200 Polish Jewish refugees from a Nazi death camp, anguishes over his failure to respond responsibly. Another scene where he, he breaks down. He could have done more, he should have done more, infinitely more, beyond physical or rational capacity, more, more, more. That's an experience of the law of hospitality, the infinite law. Let's um, show this clip very quickly. Did you find it? I don't think it's any It's all right, I don't want to waste too much time on it. It's just, there's a scene at the end 
when um, he lets the he lets um, well everyone's leaving the the factory. He saved all these people, and um, he's going to drive away before the Germans show up, and um, and he he breaks down. It's a very moving scene. Hit at, at the at the fact that he still has this car that would have been maybe ten people. He still has a pen that's gold. He thinks maybe two people could have gotten it. at least one, maybe two. And why did I keep this? Why did I keep that? I could have done more. I should have done more. How could I have kept anything? Right? And he and he sort of dissolves. He crumples. But you're looking in the entire the entire scene shows this field of people. There are twelve hundred people there, ish, um, who are alive because of him. One would think he responded responsibly, but the law of hospitality has no conditions and no limits. That's what Derrida is trying to describe an experience that you experience only in trying to respond and not being able to. You can't finish where you can finally go, okay, I responded responsibly. Uh, that's a, it's, it's, a, it's a pressing and infinite demand. And so one of his questions is, where does it come from? Right? Where does it come from? It's not in a book. There's no, anytime hospitality is written about, it's written about with conditions, right? And yet the impulse is limitless and unconditional. So, this punishing law, this law of hospitality, which is neither natural or prudent, requires that you break all the laws. Ignore the physical, logical, na uh, political, and reciprocal conditions that limit the scene of hospitality. That's what you see Schindler going through in that scene. Right? So Daria knows that it is as though the categorical imperative of hospitality demanded that we transgress all the laws in the plural of hospitality in its name. But in as much as it commands you to break all the laws, it by definition could not be a categorical imperative. What's a categorical imperative? You must always act in a certain way. Okay. Always universal. Yes, where um, where you would make of an action a universal law. Everyone should always do this, right? So you couldn't say everyone should always do this. So it can't be a categorical. But it's as though, right? It's as though um, this were a categorical imperative in forcing you to break all the laws, the limits. Right. So we're not in the realm of reason here. This has nothing to do with logic or reason, this law. What Derrida is doing here is taking up Emmanuel Levinas's proposition that an originary hospitality, um, a nearly existential predicament of hospitality, both precedes and is the condition for the formation of the ego and so for consciousness, as well as for any um, hospitality in the classical sense. And that's what we're going to unpack here. So according to Levinas, you have welcomed the other before you have the chance to choose. That's your original state having already welcomed the other. 
And that's why for him a kind of originary peace precedes any possibility for war. Right? First there's peace. And that's how come we can say no and fight. There'd be um, no war. War would be a reaction, a no, to someone already welcomed. A no to the always prior welcoming, the hospitality you've always already extended before you've got the chance to choose. Because um, there's no way to fight with another who hasn't already made his or her way in. So before I can consciously welcome you or turn you away, I must already have welcomed you. The condition for my yes or my no to you is a more radically fundamental hospitality. A yes come in that's extended before I have the chance to choose. And for Derrida, that means that this yes, any yes that you consciously say is already a double yes. A yes, yes. You see that in many of Derrida's texts where he's shorthand, he just says yes, yes. In which the consciously chosen yes is preceded and made possible by a first yes, a welcome before the choice, which is constitutive of any singularity. Okay, now let me stop there. A singularity is not the same as um, an individual. Uh, let's say... Traditionally, the individual, in, throughout the history of philosophy, um, is an identity, a product of the metaphysics of presence that simply exists and is present, fully present. But after Derrida, after the um, introduction of Iterability, dissemination, et cetera, et cetera. And we know that there's no fully present presence. There's no individual that's not already the product of a differential relation. The relation comes first. So, for example, um, Deleuze talks about um, singularity, Deleuze and Guattari both. Um, but to lose more, um, in terms of hecaity, right? Um, and he uses the example of, say, a storm system. Storm system is something you can, you're laughing at, you remember this. You can identify it. You know, you can watch it on radar, come through, point to it, but it's not cl a closed off, um, sufficient system. It's not a closed system. What you see on the radar is a product of continually interacting dynamic of forces, right? It's a, this, this thing, this singularity, this hecaity that we call a storm system is radically exposed, right? And so winds over here, a, a, a heat wave over here, what is it? A, fluttering of moth wings way over there. All of that is, um, is played out in, in, um, in the definition of this singularity or hecaity that we're going to call a storm system, right? You can identify it, but it's not closed or self-sufficient, right? So what, he's get, what Deleuze will do is say, that's, that's who you are. You're very much like a storm system, right? You're a product, always, of these interrelated forces. Change of force, change you. Change of relation, change of you. Singularity from Derrida, and I'll see the other angle over here, from the, 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 other, um, the other line, um, is um, basically this, described the same way. 
that um, this differential force is what allows there to be a you, because there is a you. But it's not self-sufficient, it's not independent, and it is not self-enclosed. It's always a product, it's always relational, and um, it's always in the position to respond. Right. Okay, so that's what I mean when I say this welcome before the choice is constitutive of a singularity, but not an identity, or not an individual, right, in the philosophical sense. An individual would be just the opposite, right? That's the ideal, that an individual is a self-sufficient, fully enclosed identity that adheres to the first principle of logic. A is A, principle of identity, right? It's um, self-sufficient and self-identical. A singularity is relational, a product of differential forces and relations. So, very, so by definition, cannot be self-sufficient, cannot be self-enclosed. It operates on a structure of exposure, and it's dependent on its structure of exposure. So if you're a singularity, you are, by definition, already responding to a welcoming that happened before you got the chance to choose. That's what Derrida's drawing out here. How many of you have read the telephone book? Avital Renell's The Telephone Book? Have you heard of it? Yes. Okay. You should read that. Um, Can I ask one question about the yes, yes? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not presumed to be universal. I mean, for everybody. I mean, like you're saying, there's uh, this, this precondition of welcoming that is very, very wide, unlimited, unfulfillable because it is so unlimited. And then there's the specific choice that comes in when any given individual walks through the door. And then that set of circumstances really tests any individual pairing's ability to act on this potential hospitality, but right, I mean, is it pre is Derrida presuming that the yes, yes is really there for everybody? Let me just tweak the way you describe that just Please. a little bit. Um, so, when that individual walks through the door, individual walks through the door, um, already in that instance, that, that existent is affecting me, right? In other words, has been welcomed. Yeah. And then you can say, get the hell out of here, right? Or, come on and sit down next to me. But before you get the chance to choose, even in, in the individual instances that you're talking about, the welcome has occurred. And by welcome, that means they're in there already, affecting you. Um, and that's the only reason that you could say, get the hell out of here, right? That's what Levinas is trying to show. So a no is already a yes, no. You had to have said yes before you could say no. And what I was going to demonstrate is through, through the telephone book is, that's what, uh, so the telephone book begins, this is the beginning of the book, and yet you're saying yes. That's the way it begins, um, an odd beginning. What she does there in the telephone book, let me, um, I think I wrote down here. Here's the beginning of the telephone book. And yet, you're saying yes, almost automatically, suddenly, sometimes irreversibly. You're picking up telephone. Means that the call has come through. It means more. You're its beneficiary rising to meet its demand, to pay a debt. You don't know who's calling or what you're going to be called upon to do, and still, 
you're lending your ear. Giving something up, receiving an order, it's a question of answerability. What she's suggesting here is an analogy of your existential, nearly existential predicament. I'll explain the nearly in a minute. When you pick up the telephone, your first word is yes or hello. Right. It means yes, even if you say hello. Before you can say yes, I will take your call, or no, I will not take your call, you have taken the call. In order to say yes or no. Right? So if your phone is off, <laughs> but what if you're sitting there? You have a phone. You have a phone. You have a phone. You have a phone. You have a message. Nobody's off. If you have a phone and you can't leave a message, you, and you, you turn it off. Number. Your number already exists. So you create the option that someone could just leave a message. Trying to get out of the system. Okay, we're going to come back to this after I finish a few more of these points so that we can then contextualize that off tele that telephone um, that, won't take a, don't, that won't take a message. So already in picking up, you have responded. Welcomed the other in. Indeed, even before you pick up, Davis, even before you pick up, the ringing itself announces that the other is in. Already. Oh, it's on silence. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the vibration itself. No vibration. Okay. <laughs> so, it's on the phone. Yeah. Exactly. 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 Okay, so the ringing itself, or the vibration, whatever, announces that the other is in, has already come in through the phone line, or the cable line, or the cell signal, or whatever, that runs into your home or your pocket from the outside. From the outside of what you define as you, or your home. The line, or the signal, turns your home, whether that be your person or your house, the sovereign space at which you consider yourself at home with yourself into a structure of welcoming. So this is Derrida. In order to constitute the space of a habitable house and home, you also need an opening, a door and windows. You have to give up a passage to the outside world. The monad of home has to be hospitable in order to be ipse, itself at home. That's on page 61. So there is a constitutive violation of the supposedly inviolable. By the time the phone rings, or the text arrives on your screen, or whatever, by the time you're presented with the option of answering, or inviting, or hosting, you've already welcomed the other already offered your yes, come in. Obviously the phone is only um, a, a metaphor for this predicament. That, you, that the singularity lives. Any singularity lives. That's the difference between a structure of enclosure and a structure of exposure. Um, in the telephone book, later on, um, you're not going to get to take Ronell's class, are you? You're, she's because she's an honest student. Okay. Um, so in the telephone book later on, um, she describes a, a telephone call that um, everyone used to presume she made this prank call to Derrida, but it was not her. She insists, <coughs> but. She describes a scene where somebody calls Derrida up long distance from the States. Collect. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and the operator says, you know, will you accept this call? And he's riding. And he describes it also. He describes it in maybe the postcard. 
or something. No, 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 no. I think it's in Of Grammatology. But in any case, he describes the telephone call also. So there's this phone call, and he he picks it up, and the operator says, will you accept these charges? It's from a Martini Heidegger. <laughs> so clearly some Americans are having a party, right? And so and he makes a decision, having answered, he makes the decision not to accept the charges. And then he suffers a little about the decision. He wasn't quite sure whether he should take the call or not, but the point was that he took the call. And that's why we have the accounts of it. He already took it. So she describes it, he describes it. The idea that before the so-called self-conscious subject can say, yes or no, come in or get lost, this subject at some level that's not self-conscious has already said come in, already welcomed, already demonstrated a kind of hospitality before the choice. Well, but that hospitality that responds to the law above and beyond the laws um, has an interesting relationship indissociable relationship with, hot, with the laws of hospitality and that's what Derrida is going to trace well, two things, first if it was actually in, in grammatology, of grammatology Heidegger was still alive then it might have actually been him but um, the my real question is that the, the first yes, I mean, it seems that the first, the overriding yes, the more important one is, I mean, ultimately more of a product of multiple people. It's, I mean, at, you know, as we, you know, we talked about this kind of blank slate, the originary piece that Levinas is describing. It's, well. Wait, why is that a blank slate? Well. Maybe not thanks slate and more. It, re it requires the social, is what you're saying. It, it, it requires this, 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 this opening, every abode meeting, an opening, the ringing of the telephone. The second it's all the sense. Faciality, like you, you, it's this exposure to another mm -hmm. that you already welcome, but that, but that requires the social, right? I mean, that's yeah, I'm, I'm kind of wondering like what, what. What stage of humanity puts in the first yes? Where does that kick in? Well, it would be easy to suggest in a Derridian line that there is no reason to presume it would be a level of humanity that, that where that begins, right? Anything that responds, right, would already um, be in this predicament. Um, and maybe along those lines, I think there's a compelling case from a variety of different strains of psychoanalysis to be made that the I that comes about as an individual is the failure to sustain a yes, yes. So I, I, I'm the part of the parent infant dyad. Um, and so then the, there's a parent infant dyad, and it used to be thought that maternal, and it's, they always think about it in maternal, it's because it's it's all anybody in developmental science can think about. It is, is mothers. But maternal sensitivity to the infant was of absolute importance. The absolute importance that the mother be constantly sensitive to the infant. That is to say, enacting from within the social a yes, a yes, a constant, ongoing, nonstop yes to this infant, which is, in effect, itself a yes. Nothing more than a yes in that, in that view of things. And then... You, you know, the, the view shifted to where we said that actually what's important in early development is the repair of ruptures. That, that actually what matters, what's interesting in the development of psyches is the constant rupturing, the inability to sustain a yes, yes, a uh, bivalent yes, yes. A series of ruptures that bring in little no's and then get repaired with new yeses. And so that the individual that would later be able to pick up the phone is emerging as the mark of the impossibility of just sustaining a yes, yes over time. I mean, I don't, that's certainly not the, any origins of humanity story, but it, it's a, if you, there's an origin story. A, a slightly different version of that is, is, is Lacan's um, 
origin story, right? The, the, the idea that, um, it's not exactly an origin story, but the idea that there is first an originary sociality. It's very Levinasian in a certain sense, until the, the so-called mirror stage, right? First, the, and, and Freud has the, has, um, the same notion in, um, in, his, in his works. <clears throat> the idea that there's, um, in the beginning, that there's no way to differentiate between self and other slash mother, right? And, you know, to, Freud talks about how, um, you know, what a shock it is when the breast is, like, not around. And you have to recognize that, in fact, oh, it's not part of you. Right? And then, it's in that separation and um, through reality testing, where you know the breast keeps going missing, um, that that the the kid has to start to recognize a sense of differentiation. In the con, it's the mirror stage where it doesn't necessarily have to do with the mirror, but it's um, the recognition of an outline of an other, and then and it looks so self-sufficient, and then a displacement, a misrecognition of that outline as an outline of self as well. So, so in any case, these theories all begin with the idea of an originary sociality. Yeah. That's it the difference. It seems very primordial. I mean, like, it's know. very different, though, from traditional philosophy. Fair enough. Right. But right. Yeah. So, so the idea of where that would come in is, right. Um, in, a, in a sense, it's, it's more like, instead of thinking of you're born as an individual, as a person, it's almost like there's an immediate splitting that happens sometime after birth, so that one thing becomes two. And, and I, I think actually Delandis' most recent book, the Synthetic Reason one, has a go at, at saying where that comes in. I mean, I hate to bring in a really bad analogy, but like right after the Big Bang, you have <laughs> the four forces of nature, for, um, gravity, e &M, strong and weak nuclear forces, there is a, a s sequence of time where these forces actually differentiate themselves in the soup of energy and matter that is more infinitely dense than we could ever wrap our heads around. And in an incredibly short period of time, first gravity appears, then e &M, then probably strong or weak nuclear force because those are ultimately functions of electricity and magnetism. And so in a period of time, suddenly, what starts defining our world? They, they become these layers of you know, the universal laws of nature, the physical laws. And so what you're describing with this first yes seems to be something that's, like I say, very primordial, something that's very necessary to society, like you say. And, um, or, just, or just communality. Like, yeah. Like being able, like a response, like animals being able to respond. You know, whatever. I mean, you're opening up to the outside. You may not even be another person. Yeah, it primordially. Um, well, it reminds me of um, what you say about the face. You know, in essential, in essential solidarity is that the face already opens up a possibility for communication. Just right. Just <laughs> the, the face. These eyes. These nose. You know, like uh, in that. Um, in the beginning, it's a very. And then there are parts of your face that you can never even see, that others can know. It's like a troping as you turn. There are parts of your face. talks about that in an, in an interview. The fact that you never see your own face, and you never see, you never see yourself the way everyone else is seeing you. Yeah, it's interesting. So, so you are made by the way everyone else looks at you looking. But you never see yourself look, right? You can't see yourself look. Um, I apologize, I may not have the um, facile memory that, um, it, so this may be, may be obvious to other people, but going to the margins, like, um, obviously I'm kind of obsessed with pathology and so-called pathology. Um, where, how would this framework process or come to terms with, for instance, sociopathy? Sociopathy? Yeah, so sociopathic. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> Do you want to say more? It's a huge question, right? Um, uh, well, the so, anti-social. Um, well, because yeah. let me let me explain why I said that's a huge question. Okay. Because um, it, 
the, the simplest way to approach that would be to say that <coughs> um, that what you just called antisocial, which I would not say, not equate with um, like sociopathology. No, they're, they're not equal. DSM has replaced sociopathy with antisocial okay, personality but, okay. disorder. But they're, so, yeah, you're not, they're not equal. So the anti already suggests that there's a fighting against, mm -hmm. right? So, so that one would have to assume that the welcoming, once again, is too okay. much. Okay, go back, go back to sociopathy, because that's like okay. the real interest. The total absence of um, connection, or the alternative, like the preemptive total, um, total exclusion of a social system, like total isolation. You understand that you're asking me to like, this is huge. You're dumping a very huge question in the last five seconds. But, but let me, I mean, that's not a small question. It's not like, you know, it's not, a, it's not a single line answer here. This is huge what you're asking. Um, it's important. And of course, um, we have the examples of Freud and Lacan and Austin and some, in some sense, Derrida going, in fact, to the failures or to the to uh, in Lacan and, and, and Freud to the the um, the, uh, the pathologies in order to figure out what what we call normal right because the normal is just a variation right, of, what, of what gets diagnosed as as pathology okay so we have that as a as a precedent we could do that it's very difficult to answer that question in any reliable way because um, the, very, the fact is that we don't, we don't, we really don't know very much about what happens there, except that the the predicament would be um, roughly the same, and what happens is a response to that predicament, right? Um, so, um, in let's say autism, there's no reason to presume that. The autistic child or, or, or human isn't flooded with um, with relationality. The question is how is what is the response? Right. Right. And the response is no. Right. For whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, and so one would one would suggest one might suggest that that an antisocial response is also a no. Not that you don't experience the welcoming. Welcoming is a difficult word in, in that situation. But it's a no to it. Right. Not a yes. A radical no. But can that no be preemptive? I mean, that was really what I was getting at with the, with the phone thing, is that, um, like, can, can there be a preemptive, um, not total limit, but like almost total limit, that would somehow, um, uh, I don't know, I, I feel as though there's there's sort of a weird um, opposition between the possibility of sociopathy, mm -hmm. which is a preemptive no. Um, like, I mean, these are like yeah. often fully conscious people who, um, who, are, who are taking in lots of data and making decisions um, in a somehow sort of normally um, rational manner. But I mean, it seems like there's this um, sort of odd opposition. And maybe I'm asking a bad question. Maybe maybe I'm not like thinking, I mean, I obviously haven't been able to sort of fastly think it through, um, but it just sort of sits out there as, you know, something that doesn't really, I don't know, it, it seems to sort of challenge this idea. I mean, sociopathy specifically um, seems to challenge, uh, I don't know, these ethics of hospitality. In that there is this possibility of a preemptive, like pre-communicative, um, like no. <laughs> you mean at a level of not so much ontological level, but a um, uh, maybe neuroscientific level? Is that well, what you're there's saying? like a no to the inclusion into the social body, um, and since this seems to be somehow like premised on. Um, a kind of 
primary sociality. I don't remember what you called it. Um, primary, pri uh, primary sociality, originary mm -hmm. sociality. Yeah. So with the sociopathic, um, that you know, I mean, in a way, they're in, they're interrogated in an economy, right? So you could you could you could make a case saying, okay, they're, they're part of the social body because they engage in economic transactions and blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. um, but then on, on another dimension, they're not. <laughs> they are not. There is no sociality at one dimension of that description. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, let me let me pose this. That does not mean the way that they respond does not mean that they are not affected. That's what I'm trying to suggest. That, that mm -hmm. they're not affected constantly. Mm -hmm. The question comes in as to how, um, I would suggest, the question comes in as to how they respond to that, that affect, that affection. Okay. So that, mean, that would mean that, how, um, that any sort of quote unquote disorder, right, and that is um, really problematic. I, yeah, I didn't mean to go there. But. Right, but, but any kind of, what, I mean, what any medical profession is going to call a disorder when you say sociopathy, right? So, I mean, philosophically, of, really. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to respond philosophically in the sense that first, any any being that responds is put in the is not getting paid anymore. <laughs> is put in the position of um, of being affected before they have a chance to say no. Mm -hmm. Right now, they're all kinds of reasons why there would be a f very firm and continuous no. But that no comes from somewhere. And if we're talking about creatures in bodies with senses, then there is, that, then there is a kind of affection that goes on continuously. Right? And there is a response to that affection. Um, and and it is consistently no. Right. Now, when I say, I'm going to be careful here, when I talk about an originary sociality, I'm not talking about the, uh, automatically when you say originary, sociality has to be radically redefined. It's not a relation among subjects. Right. This is a, a non-subjective condition of possibility for the immersion of a subject. And that's what I mean when I say most of the effect, affects you go through, you're not conscious of them. They don't become cognitive. Right? They're experiences that give you to be in whatever way. Right? They're not experiences that you simply have. both think a little bit more about this conversation. I, I don't feel like I responded well at all, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we're connecting yet, but we'll, we'll keep giving it a shot. Okay. Okay, okay so we'll come back and, and continue with that.